Um, just, just a little curious, how many of you are, are resolution people? You make, you make New Year's resolutions. That's kind of a part of your life. How many of you like, um, no, I'm, I'm adamantly against them. I don't make resolutions. How many of you are like, I make them and I break them? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. Like we, we, we do it, we, we make these resolutions for, for all kinds of reasons. Um, sometimes it's I'm gonna try to eat better in the year ahead. I'm gonna maybe try to lose some more weight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read through the Bible in the year. I'm gonna read more in the year ahead. Um, I'm gonna stop procrastinating or, or at least I'm gonna stop procrastinating in 2021, right? You know, you, you, you think of it that way. I'm gonna be on time for things. I'm gonna reconnect with old friends. You make these resolutions. Some people are resolution people. Some people are not. I want to challenge all of us to make a resolution that I think whether you're a resolution person or not, you can make this one. Like for us as a church and for you as an individual, let's make a resolution to talk with God more in 2020. That in the year ahead, we're going to pray more. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to pray more. We're going to, we're going to talk with him more. I want to challenge you to do this. As a church, I feel an urgency that God is calling us to, to be people of prayer, maybe in a way that we haven't been in the past. As individuals, I would encourage you to take on this idea and to pray more in the year ahead. I think it's a good year for us to think about this. So for the next three weeks, we're gonna talk about prayer. We're gonna take a look at the, the model prayer that Jesus gives to us. We, we often call it the Lord's Prayer. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus' disciples ask him, they say, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he gives them this model prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, which is what we're going to look at today. In fact, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 6, you can turn there. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, it's a portion where Jesus is talking about what, what our spiritual life should be like. And as he talks about prayer, he says, this then is how you should pray. And he gives to us this model for what our prayer should look like for how we should pray. So we're, we're going to look at this over the course of the next three weeks. We're going to talk very practically about what it looks like to pray, what it looks like to talk with God, what should we pray for. We're going to look at some of those things. And then after this series, starting on January the 14th, and we'll, we'll share more with you about this in the weeks ahead, we're going to corporately go into 40 days of prayer as a church where we're going to specifically walk through a prayer emphasis for ourselves as a church as we launch really into this next decade and the things that God has ahead for us. And so I'm really excited about this and what this means. We'll, we'll look at this more and more as we go through the next couple of weeks. And prayer is an important thing. Like I, I would guess that for many of us, if, if, I, if I were to say, well, you're a person of prayer, you'd probably go, well, yeah, I, I pray. But oftentimes we pray when we're desperate, but then when things are good, we, we don't pray as much. We'll tell people that we pray for them, but then do we? You, you ever done that? Like where somebody says, man, I, I got this ingrown toenail. Will you pray for me? <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, Bob, I'll, I'll be praying for you. And then you totally forget. You don't pray for Bob's toe until you see Bob walking through the atrium. And all of a sudden you're reminded, oh, there's Bob and his toe. Dear Lord, would you bless Bob's toe before he gets to me in three feet, right? Because you, <laughs> you, you, you forgot to pray. We do it all the time. You text somebody, hey, man, praying for you. But, but do we? I mean, it's a really good question. I'd like to think that we're people who pray. If I asked you, you'd, you'd probably say, well, yeah, I, I'm, a prayer, I'm a praying person, but are you? Like, and I think there's not a one of us who would look at the year ahead and go, you know, one of the things I'm going to do in 2020 is pray less. I think I'll talk with God less. That'll be really good for the year ahead. We're not going to say that. But how healthy would it be if we would pray more? So why don't we? Like, I mean, I, I've really looked at this even in my own life and went, man, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm more of a person of prayer than I probably really am. So what keeps me from praying? And just like any other goal, you kind of have to ask yourself, what are, what are the ways that this plays out? Like, I may say, hey, I want to read more, but do I set up the time to read? I may say, I need to go to the gym more, but have I really taken a look at my excuses for why I don't work out, and then what do I have to do about that? I, I may say, I'm going I'm to spend more time with my family, but have I prioritized that family time? So in the same way, we need to ask ourselves the questions, why is it that we don't pray more? Why is it that we can go right through our days, that we can fly right through our week? We, for some of us, we can go from Sunday to Sunday, and outside of the fact that we bless our food so we don't get sick, right? <laughs> Think that way? I don't know where you're eating, but like, like, not at my house, we don't have to do it, but you know what I mean. Like, outside of that prayer, when else are you praying? Like, when else are you really talking with God? So what if we want to pray more? Next week, we're going we're gonna to talk a little more practical about how to pray. Week after that, we're going to talk about what things we should pray for. 
But today I want to, I want to give you three reasons we do not pray more. Today we're going to look, and we're actually going to look at the first verse in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. We're going to park just in that one verse today. I want to show you three reasons that I think we do not pray more, but if you'll look at what Jesus gives to us as a model for prayer, it will help us to see why prayer is all the more important. Three reasons we do not pray more. We're going to look at the first verse of the, word, of the Lord's Prayer. Here's, here's the first reason. Number one, we do not pray because we forget who we are praying to. I think a lot of times we do not pray, we do not make it a priority in our lives because we forget who it is that we're praying to. Jesus makes it very clear that when he starts out his prayer, he identifies who the focus of our prayer is to be. I think sometimes we can get so accustomed to prayer, it just becomes a few lines we say at a meal, we, we, we take it as a routine, and we forget how important this prayer time really is, but who are we talking to? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, let's look at how Jesus starts this. This then is how you should pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He starts right out there with our Father, which is a pretty big title. It's, it's, it's a name by which God is referred to periodically in the Old Testament. And in, in this season in Judaism, in, in this time when Jesus was alive, it was becoming more common for people to refer to God as their heavenly Father, to talk about the fatherhood of God. And it's really powerful when Jesus calls him the Father because he was actually the only person who's ever walked this earth that could actually say, I'm the Son of God, right? Right? And it's interesting that Jesus says, when you pray, don't say, pray to my Father. He says, don't pray to the Father. The Son of God literally says to us, pray to our Father. Like, he invites us in as children of God. That's a big deal, that relationship that we have with him when we see this. We get to call him Father, and that's really special. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest about this that that's a powerful image that God is our father, but for some of us, it's a difficult one. Like, I've had friends who have said to me, that's, that's cool that you talk about praying to God as your father, but if you had my father, you wouldn't think that was that cool. Because when you think of father, for some of you, instead of thinking of a biblical concept of what a father should be, there's other things that come to your mind. You think of someone who was absent or selfish or mean or abusive or unpredictable or cold, or angry. And so as soon as we talk about Father, it's, it's quick for you to layer on top of that idea of who God is, the idea of who your earthly father was or is, and how that then impacts and affects your life. And it's really important that you recognize that because your perfect heavenly father is different from your imperfect earthly father, right? I mean, even if you had the world's greatest dad, there were places in, in every one of our lives where we are imperfect, where we are sinful, where we mess up. And so it's important to recognize we set aside a flawed view of an earthly father when we pray. Because for some of you, to pray to a father has all this, without being disrespectful, I guess the right word is maybe baggage. It has baggage that's attached to it. And at some point, we have to set those things aside because your heavenly father does not have those same challenges that maybe you might have had with your earthly father. That makes sense, right? And so it's important for us to recognize that, that when we pray, we focus on God, our heavenly father, when we pray. We set aside our flawed earthly father, and we focus on God, our perfect heavenly father. Side note for those of you that are dads, especially those of you who still have children in your homes. Understand that the relationship that you have with your earthly children is bound to affect the perception your kids have on their heavenly father. They will view their heavenly father, whether they like it or not, through a filter of who you are as an earthly father. That's a heavy responsibility and one that God will help you with to model what it means like. And I think God is, is honored when we come to him and say, God, help me to be the father that you would have for me to be so that when my kids see my life, it's a reflection of you and me. It matters. We focus on God, our heavenly father, when we pray. So what does that mean? What do we know about a father? Let me just show you two things. Because God is our father, we can pray with intimacy. Because God is our father, 
we can pray with intimacy. There's a relationship that comes. There's a vulnerability. There is an openness that when we come to God, our Father, we know we can come to him without pretense. We know that we can come to him with authenticity because we know that we have this, I I use that word intimacy because it implies a closeness that is there that goes deeper than just a surface relationship. The, the, the term that would have been used in Jesus' time for father was Abba. It, it's the name that children would refer to their earthly fathers by. And it has this built-in tone of warmth and intimacy, the security of a loving father's care. And that's the, that's the name that they're using here. When Jesus says, Abba, Father, he's saying there is a relationship. There is this warmth. There is this intimacy. There is this connection that is really powerful and that is really healthy in that moment. Later in this same sermon that Jesus is preaching in the book of Matthew in chapter 7, he says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. You've heard that passage before, right? You've heard that? Verse 9, or verse 8, excuse me. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? See what it says here? That your Father in heaven isn't trying to set you up. He's not trying to trick you. He's not holding out on you. He's got good gifts to give to you, which that's a powerful verse to consider in the backdrop of this last week where so much of probably what you did in your your cycles of celebration had to do with gift giving. And how you want to give a good gift, especially if you're a parent, you want to give that good gift to your children. And your heavenly father desires to give you the gifts that you need in your life. And he knows what we need, right? He also knows what we do not need. And there's times when I'll say to him, God, I need this. There's times when you, have a, as a parent, have probably said to your children, no, this is probably not the year you need a drum kit, right? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> there's certain things you're like, no, not right, not right now, Right? But there is this idea that God knows what we need. He knows what we do not need, but he loves us and he gives good gifts to his children. He's not withholding anything from us. He's not holding back. He's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to take advantage of us. He is a loving father who you can trust in that way. Because God is our father, we can pray with intimacy. And then watch this. Here's the second part. Because God is our father, we can pray with confidence. There's a certain confidence that we have because God is our father. A father comes with with not just wisdom, but with security, with protection, with godly authority. There is something that stirs up inside, and because of that relationship, there is an intimacy and a confidence you can have when you come to God, because you know that he's got your back. I can can tell you this, it's it's, it's really a, a funny thing. Um, our, our youngest is 19, right? So we're kind of out of the, the minor stages in life with our kids. And yet, and this, this happened just within the last week, like you can mess with me and that's fine. You can say things about me. You can be unkind. You can be rude to me. You can dismiss me. And that'll be okay. But don't you mess with my kids. Anybody? You want to see the pastor hat come off real quick? You mess with my kids. And just, it was, it's so funny how there's something that stirs up inside of me. Somebody was rude to one of my kids this week. And I was like, you want me to fix it? I'll fix it right now. <laughs> I'll fix it. There's just something that stirs up inside of you because that's this father's nature. So if you know that your dad has your back, you communicate in a different way. You have an intimacy and you have a confidence. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Jesus, he was talking about the hypocrites. We'll look at this actually next week a little bit more as we we dig into this passage. But Jesus is talking about the hypocrites and he says this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 8. He says, do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. That's a good word, isn't it? I mean, even before you ask, he knows what you need. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Like your Father will take care of you. You can trust him. You can come to him with intimacy and with confidence. My dad, his, his job was he was the 
was the maintenance supervisor for a school district. Not the school district that I attended. We lived in a different community, but a neighboring school district. He was like the maintenance supervisor. So everything that wasn't education, so buses and maintenance and custodial and uh, cafeteria, like all the inner workings that, that weren't the education part. My dad supervised all of that. So he, he kind of he kind of led a, a lot of different people and a lot of different things in this school district. And I can remember elementary school, I'm probably eight, nine years old, and, um, and, and there was a day when my, my school didn't have school for whatever reason. So I went to work with my dad, and they had school that day. I don't, I don't remember why, but I got to go with my dad to work. And his office was in the high school, and I can remember eight, nine years old, walking through this high school and walking past all these big high school students with a certain swagger. And I remember just kind of like rudely like pushing one of the kids aside or saying something. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I remember my dad going, what are you doing? Like, you can't act like that. And I remember in my mind, and I think I said to him, I, I can do whatever I want. I'm with you. And my dad's the man. And because my dad's the man, these high school punks better look out because this nine-year-old's coming through. Right now, look, don't do that. Don't be dumb. <laughs> but you can walk with a certain spiritual swagger, not because you're prideful, but because your father loves you. And when you pray and when you come to him, you can know with confidence and with intimacy that he has your back. I think so many times we live in this fear that we're nobody, but to God, you're somebody. You are his daughter. You are his son. He loves you. He has called you. You are his child. So don't miss that word. So many of us, we've memorized the Lord's Prayer at some point in our lives because maybe we wanted to or because maybe we were forced to. Right? If you grew up in a Sunday school setting or if you grew up in a more liturgical setting, there's a good chance you had to memorize the Lord's Prayer so that when you hear it or when you say it, it's just words that come out of your mouth because you're familiar with them in some way. But take a moment, think about this. He's your father. So there is relationship and there is confidence. There is intimacy that comes with that. So when you pray, don't forget who you're praying to. There's something special that happens there. Can I take a little side note too? I don't want to take a long time on this, but just think about this too. Jesus does not say, pray my father or your father. He says our father. So our, our relationship with God is not just about us. And when we pray, we don't just pray for us or we don't just pray with ourselves. There is a corporate component to our prayer. You know, one of the things that's interesting about our lives is it can be real quick, especially even in our church attendance, that our relationship with God is all about Jesus and me, and we fail to make it about Jesus and we. Does that make sense? Like, I'll be honest with you, th these rooms where we have our services are specifically designed as movie theaters for you to come in and have one point of focus and really not interact a whole lot with other people. The danger of that is you could think that coming to church is about Jesus and me, when actually it's about Jesus and we. And your 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 brothers and sisters in Christ, we need each other because we share the same Father. And we need to pray for one another because we share the same Father. So prayer is really important when we think about these things. So the first reason that we often don't pray is because we, we forget who we're talking to. Here's a second reason, number two. We do not pray because we're not convinced that prayer matters. I think sometimes we don't pray because we're not that convinced that it really makes that big of a difference. We're not convinced that anything's going to happen. Oh, yeah, you'll say, well, I'll pray for you. Or, yeah, we need to pray about that. But do you really? Like, and are you convinced that if you do pray, it will change things? I'm always a little bit disappointed in myself when I pray about something, and then I see an answer to that prayer, and I'm surprised. You ever done that? <laughs> like, you pray about something, and then you're like, well, that worked. I suppose I ought to do that more often. Right? I need to consider that when I pray, there is something that happens. How do you know that? Go back to who you're praying to. What does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This, then, is how you should pray. When you pray, pray to our Father in heaven. Like when you, when you pray our Father in heaven, you're not just saying in heaven so that the prayer doesn't get delivered to the wrong place. Right? You're not just saying that so that you hope it gets to God's front door or that it hits his email box. Like the, the reality is when you say that, you are declaring something about not so much where he is, but who he is. He is the God who's in heaven. 
And so that's a powerful thing. How do we know? Let let me read to you some passages from Psalm 33, which talks specifically about what it means for God to be in heaven. Because if he's in heaven, he has all power. Consider what that says about him. Psalm 33, verse 13. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do, When we say that God is in heaven, we are acknowledging that God is greater than we are. When you say that God is in heaven, you are acknowledging God is greater than we are. He has a perspective that is above us. He can see from beginning to end. He knows exactly what is happening. He is not bound by time. He is not bound by space. He is not bound by what's happening in our world. And we can often only see this point right here, but he knows what's in the future. He knows what's going on in the lives of other people. He knows what is best for you in the big picture and especially in eternity. So when we say God is in heaven, it is an affirmation that he is great than we are, which is really important to get to when you pray. Because I don't know if you're like me, oftentimes when I pray and I ask God for something, I also know exactly how would be the best way for him to answer it. Anybody else? God, I'm gonna tell you, I'm I'm praying, and here's specifically what you need to do, God. God, I need that check for $5,000 in my mailbox by three o'clock tomorrow, and I know you can do it, God, and there's no other way that you can do this right, God. Amen. Thanks for listening. Right, that's, that's my idea. Like, I've got it figured out. God, this is exactly what you need to do. When actually what I need to be willing to say is, God, I know that you're greater than I am. And God, I know that you see beginning to end. And I got, I got, I know you're working some things out here that I can't begin to understand. And so I trust you. And so when I pray, I believe that my prayers are going to the one who's not only greater than I am, but look at this. This is back in Psalm 33, right? The next thing. We started out, he's in heaven And then the psalmist says this, no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. See, this is cool because not only is God greater than we are, God is greater than our strength. He's he's calling this out in biblical times. People would put their strength in the size of an army or in the strength of the warrior or in the number of horses we do the same thing. We, we look to strengthen our bank account or the health in our bodies or, or the relationships that we have with other people or we think, I'm, I'm smart enough to figure this all out. But ultimately, prayer is a statement where I say, God, I not only recognize that you are greater than I am, but God, that you are stronger than I am. I, I don't know how you view 2020. Like for some of you, you're looking at 2019 and you're saying, good riddance. Glad that year's over. I know it's just a page on a calendar. I, I know it's, it's, it's just another day. But really mentally, it's helpful for us at times to mark these moments. The Bible talks about how things come in seasons and in moments. And it's helpful for us to look back in this moment. We're not just, we're not just closing out a year. We're actually closing out a decade here and starting a new one. And those are important things to consider because we have these mile markers and these posts in our lives. And as you stand at this place, you're either looking back and going, man, what a great year, what a great decade, or what a lousy year. I can't wait for it to be over. And some of you also, though, are looking at 2020 and you're going, God, I don't know. Like, there's a lot of change coming in my life, or there's big decisions that I have to make, or God, I'm uncertain about January. And Lord, I just know that I I need some strength When you pray, will you actually believe that he's the one who can strengthen you? Because more than armies, more than horses, more than warriors, more than cash, more than your house, more than your own strength, more than your own ability, he is the one who gives us our strength. And not only that, but then look at what what else is, is said here. Psalm 33, verse 18. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Did you hear what the psalmist said? He says, God, I know you're greater than I am, and I know your strength is greater than mine, but God, I got some big challenges, and I need hope, and I need help. I like this one. I need a shield I need somebody to be with me. And some of you are are looking down the barrel of 2020 and you're like, man, there are some big things 
coming my way. And you're not excited about it. You might even be fearful about it. And can I tell you, when I read this psalm, it tells me God is greater than our challenges. He's greater than the challenges that we face. Actually, not to be, I know it's been the holidays and stuff, but when I said God is greater than our challenges, I, I thought you might go, yes, right, or something, right? <laughs> like I said, that's good right there. I'm gonna try it again. So when I read this, it says to me that God is greater than our challenges. Yes, yeah, see, good, I thought you would like that because, because he is. Like he's greater than those things. And I love that passage because it says he is our hope. Some of you need hope. He is our help. Some of you need help. And it also says he is our shield. That means he goes before us and he protects us. There was a family recently who was visiting the zoo in Dublin, Ireland, and they were, they were in the tiger spot, you know, where they have the, the tigers are out there kind of in the, in the yard and they got the glass enclosure and you can go up and you can look, the viewing area and this kind of thing. And they went to take a picture of this young boy and the dad was smart enough to get some video. And so take a look at this. Here's, here's what we see. Here's a little guy. And watch the tiger, because the tiger, the tiger has something in mind. Isn't that awesome? No. Okay. I love it. Watch it. It'll happen again. Here comes the tiger. And oh! look at that. Do you know what that glass was for that little boy? A shield. The dad started the video because he saw something in the tiger's eye. That's, a, that's an earthly father right there who will let the son be that traumatized. Not a heavenly father, <laughs> that's an earthly father. I would have been an earthly father. That was, he said it was worth the retweets right there. But if you think about that, you know what that glass did? It served as a shield. You have no idea how many times, the Bible doesn't call him a tiger, but the Bible does say that our enemy is like a roaring lion. Have you ever heard that? Looking for whom he will devour. But in that same book, the Apostle John tells us, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. You know why? Because he's greater than you are, and he's greater than your strength, and he's greater than your challenges, and he is your shield, and he is right there with you. So remember that when you pray, because our default mode so many times is to say, oh, no, what am I going to do? And then we eventually pray. But what if I said, God, I'm going to pray more in 2020. And when I come up against these circumstances, and when I realize that I'm limited, and when I'm feeling overwhelmed, and I don't know how to respond to that person, and I'm not sure how this is going to work out, and God, I'm going to trust that you see something that I can't see here. In those moments, am I quick to pray? I want to pray more in 2020, not less. Third thing, third reason why oftentimes we do not pray. I think we do not pray because we, we do not take prayer seriously. Not just that we forget who we're talking to, or not, not just that oftentimes in those moments we, we might have a tendency to not think that it works. I just wonder if we take it seriously. Maybe even more so, I wonder if we take God seriously. Really recognize that he wants you to talk to him. He wants you to know that he's at work in your life. Let's listen to this passage again. Let me read the first two verses of, of this Lord's Prayer. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You've probably seen some of those funny stories that people tell sometimes about how little kids have a hard time with that word hallowed. Sometimes kids will pray, our father who art in heaven, Harold is your name. Have you ever heard that one? <laughs> our father who art in heaven, how'd you know my name? Like there's, there's those, those ways that kids mess them up. <laughs> what it means is that he is set apart. He's, he's holy. He's revered. He's different than us. He's hallowed. That when I pray, it's first about him and it's not about me. God, I, I put you first in my life. Th this is the whole point of the first three Ten Commandments, right? Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. The, the third one. Verse seven, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Bible tells us that God's name is to be revered. And when we say name, it's, it's not just what you call him. The biblical idea of name is it comes with who that person is, with their authority, with their very person, with, with what we think of them, what we say about them, how we interact with them. Name is more than just what's, what's on your driver's license. It's who you are. And he says, hallowed be your name. So this means that when we pray, 
We're not just having a chat. We're not just filling time. We're not just blessing our food. When we pray, in that moment, we are interacting with someone who's so much greater than us that we set his name aside. Like, we don't get sloppy because he's our father. We remember that intimacy and that confidence, but the only reason we can have that is because he's so much greater than we are. And so we say, God, we we praise your name. We bless your name. We lift your name up. This is really important. See, effective prayer glorifies God's name over our needs. Effective prayer glorifies God's name over our needs. So many times when I come to God, I come to God not so much for him but for me. Anybody? Like I come to him for what I can get from him. I come to him with my list. And not so much to go, God, you're my father who is so much greater than I am. So I, I come in intimacy and with confidence because I, I want to lift up your name. Prayer at some point in our lives, and I would, I would challenge you with this as you go into the new year. Can you let prayer become more about being in God's presence than you can about what gifts you might receive from him? The great preacher Haddon Robinson tells a story about how when his kids were little, he would play a game with them where he would put pennies in his hand and then he would squeeze his fist tight. And the goal was for them to climb up in his lap and to try to get the pennies out of his hand. And the the rules were that they would have to pull his fingers back and once they were able to pull him back, you know, and there's laughing and tickling and, and wrestling and all this going on. Once they pulled the fingers back, then the fingers could not close again And they would pull his fingers back, and then once they did, they could take the pennies out of his hand, and whatever pennies they could get out were theirs to keep. And the kids loved to play the penny game, because then they would grab the pennies, and they would run off, and they would celebrate. He said what they missed is they thought it was about the pennies, when really it was about the experience of coming to your father. And for many of us, we come to God for the pennies when it's really about his presence. Because what those kids remember now are not the little pittance of coins that they got from their dad, but that their dad loved them enough to spend time with them. When you pray, what's your focus, pennies or his presence? Because the pennies only last for a moment, but his presence will change your life. In the last service, we got to this point, and I said, does that make sense? And a lady pointed out to me afterwards how ironic and funny that was. Does that make sense? (laughs) Pennies. Does that make sense? Did you get it? Yeah, it's kind of dumb. Matthew chapter 6. It's funny. It's funny. I missed it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But you'll remember it now. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Don't go reaching for his pennies. Seek to be in his presence. Here's why. Effective prayer glorifies God's name over our needs. One last thing. Effective prayer seeks God's will over our own. Oftentimes I come to God because I I want him to back me up in my will. But actually, what does he say? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next, next week, we'll dig into that a little bit more and what, what that means. But effective prayer seeks God's will over our own. Prayer focuses not on building my kingdom where I want to be the king, but on letting God be the king of my life and what I can do to move his kingdom forward. God has to stay the king of his kingdom even in my life. And God's will is always better than mine. And this is where I get sidetracked sometimes because I want my will. I think my will will work out just fine. And at some point I've got to realize it's about his will. In fact, there's a really cool thing that happens. Usually when I put his will first, that's when my life's most fulfilled. But when I'm chasing after my own will, that's when I get frustrated. Psalm 37, verse 3 says this, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Go back to verse 4. It says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
It doesn't say chase after the desires of your heart and then you'll have a delightful relationship with the Lord. It says once you delight in the Lord, that's when you'll find the desires of your heart. The Bible says that there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it only leads to death. So when I go after what seems right to me, when I'm constantly listening to what internally, my, my, you can call it my inner GPS is telling me, when I'm just driven by my own insides, it will lead me in a way that seems right, but leads to death, the Bible says. But if I will instead say, God, I'm gonna delight in you, I'm gonna seek after your will, that when I start by seeking after his will, that's when I find the desires of my heart are met. This is huge for us to recognize. So that when I pray more in this next year, when I come to those moments, and look, when I say pray more, some of that is that you deliberately take time to kind of stop in your day and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray about some of these things. We'll talk about this next week. But some of this is just being constantly mindful of God. That when you walk into a situation, you say to him, Lord, I want to do your will in this situation. God, what do you have for me in this moment? That when I walk into my school or when I walk into my work or when I come home from work and I walk into my house, that I say, God, what is your will for me in this place, in this moment? Like, how do you want to work in my life? That I'm mindful of his presence. Because in doing that, there's something powerful that happens. And here's what I'm learning. The more I trust in my internal GPS, the more it leads me astray. But the more I trust in him, the more his will brings joy to my life. It's a powerful thing. Alicia Sanchez had moved to Las Vegas in 2009. She and her 11-year-old son decided it would be good for them to get out of town and do something together. So they went on a camping trip. They went to Death Valley and they had their Jeep and they went and they had it all planned out told their family where they were going to be, and uh, they got there, and they relied on the GPS that was in the dashboard of the Jeep. And after a few days, when family hadn't heard anything from them, they alerted the authorities. And after several days, as the authorities searched, they finally found in some of the most remote, remote parts of this national park, they found tire tracks, and eventually they found Alicia's Jeep buried they think that at some point it had run over like an animal's den out in the sand and it was buried up to the axles and they were stuck there and there was no way for them to go and they couldn't get a cell signal alicia survived carlos her 11 year old son did not and they asked what happened how, how, how did you get so far off and you know what she said she said i just kept doing what the gps said to do I just kept following the GPS, but they got out into a place where there really was no signal, and a lot of those roads aren't marked in the right ways. And what's interesting is she went places where if she'd have had a map, she'd have known this is not right. If she'd have had a compass, she would have known this was not right. If she would have looked out her dash and seen all the places where she drove past, piles of rocks and brush that had been put in different places, sign that said, do not go past this point. But instead, she kept trusting what internally she was being told, and it took her places that literally... Park rangers refer to this as death by GPS. And when I seek after my own will, eventually it's going to lead to death by GPS. Because I'm going I'm to go in the way that I think is right. When instead where life begins is when I go, my father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, I want your name to be glorified here. Your kingdom come. Not my will, but your will be done. And when I make that my prayer, it brings a whole new life to the way that I live. And so can I ask you to stand with me, whether you're here in Auditorium 1 or you're in Auditorium 2, we're gonna, we're gonna take a moment, and I, I wanna pray through this prayer. Before we do, though, I wanna stop, and I wanna worship the Lord together. We're gonna sing just a simple chorus of praise to our Father. We're gonna sing about the Trinity. We're gonna sing about who He is. Would you just take a moment and open up your heart and recognize that he's greater than you are, that he's a father that loves you. Lord, in these next few moments as we come to you in prayer, God, would you speak to us as we look to you, as we sing this song of praise together. In Jesus' name, let's sing to him. Praise our Father, praise our Son.
our Father, in this moment, we come to you. And we don't just pray that title lightly. Because you are our Father, we know that we are loved and valued and that we matter to you. No matter what any person, maybe even our earthly father, has said to us or shown to us, you are a God who loves us without reservation, that you are a God who cares and wants the best for us. You're a God who has our back. And so our Father, who's in heaven, who's greater than we are, who has more strength than we do. In fact, strength that you desire to give to us, that when we wait on you, Scripture says that you strengthen us. That I can, all, I can do all these things through Christ who strengthens me. Even as we're facing challenges. And I want to I pause in this prayer for just a moment. And if you would say, whether you're in this room or your auditorium too, you're watching this on a screen somewhere. If you would say, I'm looking at the year ahead and I see big challenges and I say, God, I need your strength. I know you're bigger than my challenges and I need your strength for the year ahead. Would you just raise your hand? That's you. You'd say, God, big challenges, year ahead. Father, I need your strength. In fact, if you're comfortable, would you slip both hands to him? Just kind of in a posture to receive and say, God, I need your strength in this year ahead. Father, I know I can't do it on my own. And I need you to come alongside of me. I don't trust in armies or warriors or horses or bank accounts or people or even in my own ability. But Father, today I trust in you because you're in heaven. You can see what I can't see. You know what I don't know. I know that you're working all things together for my good. And so today I trust in you. I look at how big my challenges are and I'm reminded that my God is bigger. And so, Lord, I put my confidence in you. And I say this prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, may your name be more important in my life than my needs. Lord, may your place in my life matter more. God, may I be interested more in your presence than in your pennies. Lord, that I could know you at work in my life. And Lord, for some of us, we're looking at the year ahead and you're already, you're already whispering about some of our plans and some of our thoughts and some of our ideas that, we, that are coming maybe even from some very pure places inside of us, but you're already whispering us and asking, is that your will or is it mine? Lord, may we surrender our will to you, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come in our lives in the way that you would have it mapped out in heaven. God, that we would that we would delight ourselves in you and then see that you would give to us the desires of our heart. Lord, there's a way that seems right to us, but in the end, if it's not your way, it leads to death. And so today, today we say, Father, your will be done in our lives. God, I ask that your word would stir something in us so that as we, in this next week, as we start out the year ahead, may we pray more in 2020 than we did in this last year. May we talk with you in ways that strengthen this relationship with our Father and as a result, bring life change to us and the world around us. So now, Lord, as we go from here, we ask that you would go with us. Father, would you send us out with your special favor and with your wonderful peace? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Have a happy new year. We'll see you next Sunday.